Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself first. Um, my name is Michelle Worgan and I'm currently a materials writer for primary. I taught for many years um, and I experimented with different approaches uh, throughout my teaching career. Um, and over the years, I've discovered that the most effective approaches are the ones where the learners are at the center of the approach. So today I'm going to talk about uh, inquiry-based learning. Um, there are two ways of pronouncing this, as, as Kevin said. Um, in American English, uh, it's pronounced inquiry, but because I'm from the UK, I pronounce it inquiry. You'll also find it sometimes written with an E um, as well as an I, so a bit confusing, but... Um, uh, Inquiry-based learning is a learner-centered approach, um, and in this session we're going to look at how it might work in the primary ELT classroom. And during the session I'll be showing you some examples of materials that I've designed uh, in order to help explain the process. That is the process that I go through when I'm designing an inquiry. But I think we need to start with uh, what we're going to do in this session. So the first part will be an introduction to inquiry-based learning. After that, I'll show you my process for designing an inquiry. I'm going to talk briefly about learner autonomy. And at the end, if there's time, I'll do a quick summary, but I do want to leave a few minutes for questions uh, if possible. Okay, you'll see an icon on this slide of a group of people. When you see this icon, it means that I'll be asking you a question to answer uh, either in the chat box or, or somewhere else. Okay, so what is inquiry-based learning is, I think, the question that we need to ask ourselves first. Um, I'd like to know whether you have heard of inquiry-based learning before or not. So um, have you heard of it? Do you know what it is? Um, just type a yes or no in the chat box. Okay, we're getting a few yeses. Quite a lot of yeses. That's, that's, that, well, that's good because it means I won't have to explain too much. Um, it's actually quite surprising to me because I talk about this topic quite a lot and often uh, the uh, the teachers in the audience haven't really heard of it or they don't really know what it is. Um, I am going to give a very brief explanation of what it is, uh, just in case you're not sure. But it's basically an approach where learners investigate a real world topic in order to find answers to a question. Um, it's similar to project-based learning, which you have probably heard of, and it follows a similar process to this. So an inquiry is basically a kind of project that's built around a question on a specific topic. Um, it's often used in mainstream education, especially in subjects like science, where students need to find something out uh, through research and experimentation. In English language teaching, it's more of a topic based approach, but instead of pre deciding what students will learn and with providing the materials that we've chosen specifically, we're allowing students to explore their own questions about the topic. So the inquiry is centered around that natural curiosity that children have. It allows us to take that curiosity and to develop it into something that the children can learn through. It is an approach with a lot of learner autonomy, um, which is why I wanted to talk about this uh, a bit later on. Um, but it is a very structured approach too, and it always follows the same series of stages. But how does it work? Well, you can see in this diagram here, this is a process. An inquiry typically follows a cycle with five stages. If you search for inquiry-based learning, you'll often find five stages with different names depending on um, the research. But I choose to display it as a process because I think it's a bit more visual. So this is gonna be a really, really, really quick summary. 
Um, the first stage in an inquiry is the wonder stage. And we start with something that we call a provocation. And this is just something that introduces the topic. It sparks curiosity in the topic um, and it engages students in that topic that they're going to be exploring. So it could be a, an image or a video or a book or an object, a toy. Um, anything that just introduces the idea of the, the global topic. Um, and then we need to introduce what we call an essential question or a driving question. And we're going to look at this in a bit more detail in a minute. But this is a question that the students will aim to answer by the end of the inquiry project. Um, so then the students can develop their own questions, think about what they want to know. Then we plan what they will do, and then they carry out some research. And we're going to again look at this part uh, a little bit later. After that, once they've got some information, they collate this evidence, and then they create some kind of a product which they then share with the class at the end. And in this product, they have to demonstrate their understanding and their answer to the essential question from the beginning. Okay, so that's kind of a one minute summary of inquiry-based learning. Um, it's, I had to fly through it obviously, because there's a lot of things that I'm going to talk about today. Um, for example, the essential question. So, I mentioned this before, it's basically the focus of the inquiry. It's an overarching question that we will keep coming back to throughout the inquiry. It's what the inquiry is all about. Um, it, by the end, as I said, students will need to be able to answer this question. But it's a very general question and it doesn't have a single answer. There's different ways of exploring this essential question. I think the best way of explaining this is through examples. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of uh, essential questions suitable for the primary classroom. So with the topic of home, for example, what makes a perfect home? This is a very wide question. Another question could be, where does our food come from? Or how do mini beasts survive? So notice how broad these questions are and how they can be answered in different ways, depending on what we ask students to investigate. There are lots of different angles we might take. And this might depend on the age of your students and also their level. Uh, for example, with the question, what makes a perfect home? we could explore the things that homes contain, but we could also think about maybe homes in different parts of the world, or we could focus on some of the more essential aspects of what a home is, rather than focusing on materialistic objects. Uh, is there something else that a good home has? And the question, the answer to this question might be different for different people. Okay, so there is no single answer here. For the question, where does our food come from? We might look at things like seasonal crops in the local area. We might want to look at a topic like veganism or maybe recipes and cooking. Yeah, there are lots of different ways or directions in which we can take this question. And with the question, how do many bees survive? We could look at their habitats. Uh, we could look at the food cycle um, or maybe even hu the human effects on biodiversity. OK, obviously, these would depend on the student's age, their de developmental level and their linguistic level. So thinking about the question, oh, sorry, I, I made a mistake, <laughs> forget that. Um, summarize quickly before we, uh, before we move on. Um, as teachers, there are certain things that we're gonna need to do in an inquiry. 
So if you think back to that diagram that I just showed you at the beginning, we start with the question that will kickstart that inquiry, yeah, and that guides that inquiry. Um, we can then design some activities that will guide the inquiry. So we need to think about what students need to know to answer the question, and this can help us plan some activities. By the end of the inquiry, we know that students need to answer the question. Um, so we can think of different activities that will help them get there and set these up over a series of lessons. And also during the inquiry process, students should be given multiple opportunities to reflect on their learning. And we need to build this into our plan for the inquiry as well. So, We've got our essential question. Imagine you've got your essential question and this needs breaking down into more manageable areas, concrete questions that students can explore because it's too difficult to answer an essential question in any meaningful way without looking at different sub areas. So what I do is I give my students sub questions. Um, and then, depending on how familiar my students are with the approach, um, I might ask them to come up with their own questions on the topic. So with the uh, essential question, how do many bees survive? I've come up with a few questions here. These are what, what I call sub questions. OK, so if you just have a quick look at those questions. And you can see how the questions go from quite simple very specific questions. So the first one, they're just identifying a few different mini beasts. Um, then they're starting to think about different aspects of the mini beasts' lives, where they live, their habitats, what they look like, um, what they do, the actions and things like that. But then they move on to more complex questions, such as what dangers are there? What do they need to survive? And how can we pr protect them? These are a bit more complex. So I can choose questions for students to research according to their, their linguistic and cognitive level, or I can have my students choose which questions they want to explore. So once the students have their questions, now they're going to do some research. But how can we get primary students to do research? because, well, you know, they're quite young. Uh, research sounds like a big, scary thing. Um, they're going to need, obviously, some scaffolding and support with the research. Uh, we need to think about how we can help our students find information that will help them answer their questions. And we can do this by bringing in different resources. And there are lots of different types of resources that you could bring in. So if we look back at these questions again, the sub questions, let's think about some possible resources that we could bring in that would help students answer these questions. OK, so have another look. And can you think of any ideas for resources? A resource could be anything um, that you could bring into the classroom to help your students answer these questions. If you have some ideas, Type them in the chat box, please. I'll give you a, a few seconds. Books, says Alison. Yes. Any particular kind of books? because there are different kind of books, so possibly non-fiction books, but also maybe picture books, stories. Okay, Leanne says, visit a nature area where these mini beasts are found. Yeah, that's a lovely idea, isn't it? To take students somewhere like a little mini field trip. Um, websites about the topic, obviously websites that are suitable, I think, for, for children. Yep. Any other ideas you can think of? Okay, watch a documentary, Mary Grace Joy. Yes, a document. There are lots of documentaries available online. Yeah, uh, just short clips maybe of different mini beasts and nature. Yeah, okay, so you can see how 
mm, providing different types of resources will start to help students answer these questions and these questions help them answer the essential question. So resources are great, but research doesn't only mean having students explore resources. Mm, we're not just giving them a book to look at or showing them a video. We can actually plan some activities to help scaffold this research stage. OK, so I'm going to show you some ideas for this particular inquiry about mini beasts. So one idea could be a scavenger hunt, which is like the idea um, that Leanne just shared. Um, so you'd have your students first make a list of mini beasts that they might find in a particular place. So it could be in the schoolyard or in their garden if, or in a local park or you know anywhere, even just in the streets. Uh, mini beasts are everywhere. So they make a list and then they visit this area and they just have a checklist and they tick them off or they tally them and they count how many they found. So that's one nice little idea, maybe to get started. Another thing that you could do is to do a mini beast observation. And you, you, you'd need to check whether this is actually possible in your school, um, but you could bring in real mini beasts and have students observe them. Um, when I was a school at school a long, long time ago in the uh, early 80s, I remember our teacher brought in some slugs and in groups, each table had a slug in the middle of the table and we had to make a model of it out of clay. And I have very, very clear memories of that. And it was kind of nearly 40 years ago. Um, so these kind of experiences, I think, can be really, really memorable. And that will help students also remember the language around it. Um, another idea would be an online search. This is your more traditional research. Um, and you could do this as a whole class, or you could have students in groups research different areas. Um, again, using a child-friendly uh, website for safety reasons. Another activity could be to show some clips, uh, as Mary Grace Joy mentioned before, and just have students notice things about the mini beasts, maybe what they look like, what they do, um, what they eat, what their predators are. You might want to focus on life cycles. And you might want to do some kind of art activity too. I think this can also help answer some of these questions, particularly the ones about what uh, mini beasts look like. Um, you could have learners compare a piece of artwork like an illustration or um, picture in a book and compare that with a real photograph because it's quite an interesting activity to do to notice the differences between artwork and reality and maybe they could then try and draw their own realistic version or an artistic version which they could use then in their product that they make later on so those are just a few ideas to show you that research isn't just reading articles um, or going online. So now students have got some information. Yeah, they've done some of these activities. They've got some information that will help them with the, help them answer their essential question. And more importantly, they have some evidence that backs up their answers to this question. So what are they going to do next? They're going to create a product, which they will later share with the class. So students can choose to demonstrate their learning in different ways. And for me, offering choice is really important in this stage. So they can choose what kind of product they want to make. So it might be a presentation, a poster, a book or a mini book, a video, um, a performance, a demonstration, um, or just a picture. It could be anything. And I think allowing students choice here is a really great way of differentiating. So why am I a big fan of this approach? Well, it has lots of benefits. 
we can use it to make sure that the language that we're teaching is relevant to the students and it's based on their needs. And we're kind of creating a need for language by focusing on the things that our students are interested in and what they want to, to know and what they want to learn and we're giving them that language. The language that they're learning is also real and they have a real purpose for using it. It's not just we're learning, we're learning it because it's in our course book. We're learning it because we need it to be able to find out what we want to know and to talk about it and share it. In his plenary earlier, Chris Rowland asked the question, what words and sentences? I don't know if you attended the plenary, but I think we need to think about this. Who decides what language we teach our students? And why can't it be the student who decides what words they want to learn? Emergent language plays a big part in inquiry-based learning because learners might be exploring different questions and they come up with words that words and phrases and structures that they need to be able to express their ideas. So it's based on their needs and it's based on their needs in terms of language, but also content. Um, and we can see where the gaps are in their knowledge. Um, and we can focus on this language, the language that they need to be able to carry out each stage of their inquiry. Another benefit is that you can tailor it to their interests. Um, you could choose inquiry topics that interest your students and invite them to ask questions about what interests them. And you can also adapt the level of inquiry that different, different students or different groups do. It's a kind of a more flexible way of differentiating because it's not like we're, I'm giving this particular student a different activity to do. It's just that this student or these, this group of students is exploring a different question, exploring a different avenue uh, to another group. And then Finally, it's engaging because in inquiry-based learning, the learners are fully involved. They help shape the inquiry with their questions and you're motivated to find out the answers to your own questions. You're much more motivated than finding out the answers to the teacher's questions, I think so. And there are more benefits um, with this approach, learners take responsibility for their learning. Um, I attended a really interesting talk this morning here uh, by Anna uh, Beshevkova. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that right. And she talked about ass assessment for learning and all of the benefits that she mentioned are also clear benefits of inquiry-based learning, things like ownership of learning and language, uh, critical thinking skills, collaboration skills. These are all elements of inquiry-based learning. So on to part two then, I'm going to now show you an example uh, so you get a clearer picture of what inquiry-based learning might look like in the classroom. So the first thing that you'll do is choose your topic and how you choose this may depend on your context and how you work. Maybe you follow a syllabus or you use a course book um, so, first of all, let's think about this. What topics are in your course book or syllabus? Just the, the general topics. Can you just share your ideas in the chat? Is mini beasts a topic, for example? Maybe it, it might be in some course books. What topics are you, do your students normally um, learn about in your, in your class? Clothes. Food, seasons, colors, numbers, greetings. Okay, so kind of, yeah, more functional language. Biomes, animals, stress. Oh, that's an interesting one. Relationships, the senses, dinosaurs. Oh, dinosaurs is a great topic. Emotions, migration, animals. Sea life, mm -hmm. 
So we've got lots of kind of animal related ones here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think animals are always interesting to primary learners. Pirates, oh, that would be a, a great one. Space, yes. Types of expressions, okay. Transport, recipes, okay, so lots of ideas. Um, and the thing is, they tend, they tend to be the same topics now, and most, most courses at least have similar topics. Sometimes it might get a bit boring, uh, but what we can do is we can try to find an interesting way of looking at it, uh, a different angle perhaps um, for our inquiry. Um, so the course book is one place where you could start. But we can also start with our learners' interests. So think now about your learners and think about what you know about them. And for example, when they come into class from break and they're chatting, what are they chatting about? What things are they really interested in? Spider-Man, Alison. <laughs> Spider-Man never gets old. <laughs> Football. Mm-hmm. What other things are your students interested in? How babies are made? Okay, that's, yeah, that would be a great question for an inquiry. Yeah, babies, play dates, okay, mobile games, yeah, video games, things like that. Um, so they're not necessarily the same topics as the ones in your syllabus or course book, but perhaps there's a way of linking the two. Mm -hmm. So you could find an interesting way of looking at something you can try to link these topics so if you're in if your students are interested in how babies are made perhaps you could link that to the topic of animals in your course book and they could find out about how animals reproduce for example okay and youtubers yes well you could uh, um depending on the age of your learners i think you could um possibly get them to find some videos by their favorite YouTubers that are related to the topic, or they could make their own YouTube video in the product stage. So the next thing you do is to plan and to add your objectives. Um, what are, or why are your students doing the inquiry and what will they learn? And there are two ways of doing this. One way is by coming up with the essential question first and think about the language that they might need during the inquiry. And if you think about the sub questions, you can think about what vocabulary instructors they will need to answer those questions. If we go back to these sub questions, what vocabulary sets do you think students will need here? So obviously mini beasts, they'll need to know, but is there any other vocabulary that you think they might need? Maybe places, for example, for habitats, um, verbs for different actions and abilities, uh, names of other animals that might be their predators, things like that adjectives yeah to describe mini beasts and also structures so again you obviously you can kind of see here there's lots of present simple questions but also can um, and there could be other grammar points that we could introduce um, the other thing you could do is to do it the other way around and you could look at your syllabus think about what language you need to cover and then try to find an essential question that requires this target language. Then once you've got the linguistic objectives, you might want to think about any other skills, think about the resources that you're going to bring in and what sub skills students could practice. Um, things like identifying main ideas um, and also other objectives, pronunciation, for example, or future skills, soft skills, these kind of things. I'm going to move on a bit more quickly because I can see I don't have a huge amount of time left. Um, the th next thing you'll do is design some activities that will help students answer the question. So 
in this example, the essential question is, where does our food come from? And I decided to have my students focus on pizza because they all love pizza. I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> um, so one of the first activities we do is to find a pizza recipe and just identify the ingredients. And then they, I'll ask them to think about whether these ingredients come from a plant or from an animal. Uh, in another activity, I have them go to the supermarket and notice where the different ingredients come from. Um, this is quite easy to find out, especially with fruits and vegetables. Usually they'll be labeled their, their country of origin in the supermarket. So quite easy to do, or if not, they could check the labels on products. And then in another lesson, they use this information. So they, the information from the supermarket and the information from the recipe to find out how far each ingredient has traveled. Um, and with older children, I might then discuss the sustainability aspect of this. And it, that could lead on to a whole other inquiry because this is another thing I didn't mention earlier, but is quite quite often happens in inquiry based learning is that it um, that more questions come up all the time and the inquiry can actually kind of move in a different direction sometimes. The next thing would be to source resources and there are lots of different resources we mentioned this earlier, not just uh, texts and videos, you can bring in objects realia and people people are a great resource I think somebody mentioned it earlier in the chat, people could be their classmates students from another class, um, teachers around the school, or maybe you can even invite some people into class, um, people with jobs related to the topic, for example, maybe parents who work in different areas. And then finally, you need to think about how you can provide differentiation and scaffolding. So all Classes are diverse and all students will have different levels of skill in skills and knowledge in different areas. So a few things you can do are to provide leveled questions and activities. So with the sub questions, you can kind of level them or grade them by allowing students a choice in formats and also by creating success criteria that caters for difference. So Maybe not all students have the same success criteria. So the final thing I wanted to mention is learner autonomy because inquiry-based learning is a learner-led approach. And this means that in a perfect world, students would come up with their own essential questions and work on topics that really interest them. However, that's not really very practical in most educational settings because we have specific objectives that we need to cover. Usually those are linguistic in our, uh, in our jobs. So it's unlikely to be, I think, successful if, you, if your students are new to this, you can't just let them go and explore what they want anyway. So I've got a quick poll. I know we haven't got much time. Um, if you can, there's a Mentimeter poll here about uh, learner autonomy. So um, you can use the QR code or you could go to menti.com and type in this code 134581 Um In fact, I'm just going to also copy the link and put it in the chat in case anybody wants to access it that way. And then on the next slide, hopefully we'll get some results. So the question is, how autonomous are your learners? So if you can do this poll, uh, go ahead. If not, you can, if you want to, you can just type in the chat as well, maybe red, yellow or green. But if you, if you, well, if you chose red, then you're probably gonna need to introduce autonomy in a very, very scaffolded way, very gradually. And also if you choose yellow, I think it still needs to be gradual um, so that we're helping students develop the skills that they need to be able to take a more central role. 
okay, I can't see any results coming. Oh, yes, there they are. So we've got, okay, two and six, okay. No green so far, okay. Um, so yes, uh, this is why I wanted to provide a few tips because, you know, I think in most contexts, um, students always need a little bit of support with autonomy. Um, so my tips then are, First of all, start off with a whole class inquiry, which doesn't mean that there's no pair work. It just means that we're doing some of it as a whole class and that students are doing the same thing. Um, so we can introduce the essential question, elicit some initial ideas as a class, and then maybe give students some thinking time maybe individual thinking time, maybe they could share with a partner, but then come back as a whole class and do that frequently throughout the inquiry. You could also come up with the questions together um, and then have the whole class research the same questions. Um, you can also plan some activities that um, everyone will do. So you've planned this in advance and you create a sequence of lessons. So this, what that you can see here is an inquiry plan based on a series of six lessons. This is just an example of how you could structure an inquiry in terms of time and lesson planning. Um, however, the timing could also be adapted depending on levels of engagement. So if students are really engaged and involved in one of the stages, that could be extended. So I use this structure the first few times I do an inquiry with a class, but the aim is always to foster greater autonomy. So let's look at a few more tips. You can start offering students some choices. They can choose maybe what kind of product they want to make. Maybe you give them three alternatives to choose from. They could also maybe decide what role they want to take in, for example, the product creation. You know? um, one student might want to draw the pictures, another student might want to do the writing, etc. And then the next time you do an inquiry, you can maybe offer more choices in more stages of the inquiry. So maybe they could choose the questions that they want to explore. So we're encouraging them to become more involved in the decision-making process uh, gradually. And we can also have them do this by bringing in their own resources. Um, for example, they may have some books at home or they may find some videos online that they think are relevant. Um, and they could bring these in to class. And it's okay if they're in L1, if they're in their home language, it doesn't really matter. Um, the rest of the work they will be doing, hopefully in English. Um, so when you've done this, uh, you've done an inquiry a few times, you're comfortable with it, your students are more comfortable with it. Um, you can then plan your own inquiry from scratch. And the aim would be to involve students as much as possible in these decisions, allowing them to eventually choose what they want to do and where they want to take the inquiry. So very quick summary. Um, this is a summary of some of the steps that I've talked about today. So first of all, you choose your topic and your objectives. You come up with your essential question. You develop some guiding questions or some sub questions that are more specific. You plan some differentiated research, research activities that students do. You then think of possible options that you, students could um, choose uh, for their project, their product, sorry. And then you also need to think about success criteria um, and evaluation. And it's actually, it's really important to think about this. Think about how students will be assessed and when. Um, students should be evaluated on the whole process of the inquiry, not just on what they produce at the end. And it's really important that they know this too. So it can help to include some self and peer assessment as well. So if you did see Anna's session this morning, she shared lots of ideas on how to do this with young learners. 
But whether you include self and peer assessment or not, it's still helpful to share the criteria with students so they know what's expected of them. Um, and the final thing I want to point out here is that an inquiry is designed to be flexible um, and it needs to be adapted to each context. So it's not going to be the same in my classroom as in your classroom. It'll really depend on the students in the classroom and you need to have that kind of flexible mindset um, and you can't plan everything in advance. You can try to plan um, certain aspects, but um, but you can't plan for everything. And I think that's just an important thing to, to, to bear in mind. So I hope you found this session useful. If you do want to know more about inquiry-based learning in ELT or any other learner-centered approaches too, you might want to check out my YouTube channel um, or follow me on social media because I'm always posting about this kind of thing. Um, and actually the resource packs that I've shown you here, um, you can find them on my website if you're interested too. Um, and finally, I just have one more question for you before I look at your questions. Um, I'd like to know how many of you would be interested in trying out this approach with your students. So all you need to do is type in yes or no. Uh, would you be interested in trying this out? I'm hoping to see some yeses, but <laughs> no's are fine too. Okay, getting lots of yeses. Oh, that's because this, this kind of really inspires me to carry on talking about this as well, um, knowing that people are interested in it. And um, yeah. Okay, brilliant. So I'm going to have a look at the questions. They've 